Well, that's a very, uh, I guess it's a familiar passage to many people, and it seems very sweet. But there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. And we're going to explore that, and I think you will be surprised by some of the things that we, um, we discover as we, as we examine it. But we have, over the last uh, month or so, been navigating through the book of Acts, which is all about the activity of the Holy Spirit in the early church. In Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus promises that in his absence he would send um, another God with us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit arrives on the day of Pentecost and, and, and becomes a part of the early church in terms of a very powerful expression. And so, um, what happens on that very same day is that thousands of people get saved. Thousands of people get saved. Now you don't hear that word used very much anymore, are you saved? And it's too bad because it's a prominent word in scripture and it's at the heart of the gospel. Are you saved? Saved from what? I didn't know I needed to be saved from anything. The Bible says that we need to be saved from the consequences of our sinful choices, our sinful behavior. And so Jesus, by his work on the cross, through his broken body and shed blood, makes a way for us to have a relationship with God. We're covered with his sins and we are, are with his blood and we are saved. Another word we use is the word converted. Have you ever heard the word converted? To be saved is to be converted, to be brought into a relationship with Jesus. By the time we get to Acts chapter 3, thousands more, I'm talking thousands, not tens, not hundreds, but thousands more are, are being converted, and it seems that they're being suddenly converted, like all of a sudden, they just make a decision to follow Christ. Now, do you remember Billy Graham and his crusades? How many of you have ever been to a Billy Graham crusade? I didn't know that mom, mom asked. Another job, yes, you? I've been to Billy Graham Crusade. I, I attended one near the end of his, his crusade ministry. But the stadium, it was in Toronto, was filled with like twenty to 25,000 people. And, and, he, and he was renowned for wherever he went, stadiums or the fields would be filled with tens of thousands of people. And he would share the gospel in simplistic language, and at the end he would give them an opportunity to make a decision whether they wanted to receive God's forgiving love to be saved, to be converted. And thousands of people would come forward and they would make their decision. And it would seem to every onlooker that their moment of decision, their conversion was sudden. But I don't believe there is any such thing as sudden conversion. Conversions are really a long-term coming, I believe. And I draw, drew the analogy, it's like babies who, are, who we think are born suddenly, but the pregnancy actually has occurred for nine months. There's no sudden baby. The baby has been a long time coming in terms of, of God creating that child in the womb of, of mom. And sudden conversion might look sudden, but for a long time people are made ready for their new birth, birth to be born again. And so God through our lives was working to bring each of us to that place of decision, but there's probably some of you here who have never made the decision, and you might take note that God is trying to bring you to that place where you will be saved, where you will be converted. Many, many years ago, when I was a young man, I worked in a, in a child care facility. It was called Park Hill Girls Home for 15 girls that were wards of the court. They weren't living at home. They were picked up off the street. And so I was working with them along with other staff. And not only was I building a rapport with many of the girls who started coming to church on some days, it was pretty a, quite a phenomenon. Um, but I also had an opportunity to interact with many of the staff. And this one gentleman, his name was Peter, and he stayed late one night and he began to interrogate me with questions, spiritually uh, oriented questions. And every time he asked a difficult question, I would reach for the Bible and I'd give him a scripture. He was from a Catholic background and he was asking me many questions that um, some of the practices weren't embedded in Scripture, so I was just sharing with him as much as I could from Scripture, and he was getting angrier and angrier and angrier at me. And all I was doing is reading him back Bible verses. Well, apparently, and I didn't know this, but he went home 
was so angry, but his anger really wasn't at me. He got down on his bed and he wept before God saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The next day, he tells me what has happened and he says, how do I become a Christian? And I said, I think you already have. You came to God and you repented. You said you were sorry. And he came into your life. And that man has grown in the faith and become a leader within his own faith community. It might appear that it was all of a sudden for Peter, but actually many events during his life have been bringing him to that point. God had been basically seeking him. And at the moment Peter began to seek God, they discovered one another. Well, if we go back into the book of Acts, we've got thousands and thousands of people being saved, being converted. And when we get to Acts chapter 8, there's three specific conversion stories that are recorded there for us. Three. And out of all the thousands, I think these three are selected because they represent three of the most unlikely people that would ever be converted. You would never consider them to be, to be candidates. The first one is Simon the Sorcerer. If you were here last Sunday, we explored Simon the Sorcerer. Here's a man who is spiritual but not religious. Have you ever heard that term? I'm spiritual but not religious. The majority of, of Generation X, Y, and Z will say this. I'm spiritual but not religious. Um, Simon the Sorcerer. He's obsessed with power, with fame. He's oblivious to the real God. But when the apostles move into Samaria and there's miracles happening, like real powerful miracles, thousands are, are, are being converted and Simon is baptized and he becomes a believer himself. Wow. That's a pretty powerful conversion. The other one that Acts talks about, and I'm holding this one off till next week, because it really talks about it in Acts chapter 9, is a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And he's religious, but he's not spiritual. He's, 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 met, he's controlled by all sorts of Judaic rules and regulations. He's religious. He has no compassion. He's full of fear and intolerance. But he... He becomes converted, he has a near-death experience, and we'll explore that next week on the road to Damascus. And he's the one heading up the persecution against all the new believers. A very unlikely candidate, but God saves his soul. No, the one, the number three is the, actually number two, the one in between um, Simon and Saul is an Ethiopian. An Ethiopian. And he's just probably the one we would most identify with out of all the three. Now, it sounds like a sweet little story, what Caleb read. But as I indicated, there's more happening here than we find at first read. So are you ready to meet this man? Do you want to meet this Ethiopian fellow? Come on, tell me you're with me. I want to meet the Ethiopian. All right. He's from Africa. Really? He's from Africa. He's from Ethiopia. But Ethiopia in the first century is not the Ethiopia today. The land boundaries have changed. Actually, Ethiopia in the first century uh, existed between the Aswan Dam, that is in modern day Egypt, down to Khartoum in Sudan. So the boundaries were different. And it pretty much made up the Nubian desert. So this fellow was an African. He was a Nubian. All right? So that's who he is. And we learn from the text that he was an important part of the royal family in that country. He served Candace, which was the title of the queen, not her name, but the title. He served in that palace. He had a good job. He was well paid. He handled their finances. You would say he had it made. But in order to be employed, to have that role, there was a personal cost. And it was a big one. You had to be emasculated if you were a man. To protect against any sexual impropriety with the queen or with the princesses or with the harem that, that dwelt there, all males within the palace had to have their testicles removed. They had to be castrated. That's a big commitment, don't you think? All the men are going... We call such a person a eunuch. Now, if that procedure was done prior to puberty, 
then the production of hormones was interfered with and affected the male in his development. And so he would grow to look more effeminate. He wouldn't have facial hair. All this to say, we have a man here who's not just from Ethiopia, doesn't just work in a palace, but he likely struggles with his sexual identity and, he, and how he feels about himself in relation to both men and women. He's a eunuch. On the one hand, he holds a respectable position. On the other hand, he knows he's different from everyone else and is subject to ridicule. Now the story's starting to feel a little different. Oh, but this isn't the end of it. This man represents, to all of us, anybody who struggles to fit in in the culture. I think even more specifically, it represents, he represents, the 4% of the population that are confused by their sexuality and would identify as being attracted to same-sex people. But we're not done. This man is interested in God. He's looking to find meaning in life. He wants to know where he fits. Does God accept him? Well, he's spiritually hungry. We see that and he wants answers. And it says in verse 27 that this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he travels from Jerusalem, from Ethiopia, first century Ethiopia, all the way to Jerusalem. To worship. Now you might think from that verse that this man is a proselyte. A proselyte is a Gentile or somebody who's outside the Jewish community who converts to Judaism in order to worship with them. But I don't think he is. And I'm about to tell you why. You've got to give him credit at first though. He's an all-in kind of guy. He's an all-or-nothing kind of person. I mean we see this in the fact that in order to work in the palace he allows himself to be made a eunuch. This is a someone who goes the distance. But now in terms of his spiritual quest, he's not going to let a couple weeks of inconvenient travel deter him. He's going to make the journey on an ox-driven cart, which was a chariot back then, and he's going to go to Jerusalem and worship with the Jewish people. He's going to try to worship their God. Now God says in His Word in many places, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. That's echoed over and over again. It's a promise that if you seek for God, you will find Him because He's looking for you. So I believe God's going to honor this man, but what this African, this Ethiopian, this eunuch, this man who struggles with his sexual identity and where he fits, what he doesn't know is that when he arrives in Jerusalem and he goes to the temple, they are going to reject him. You say, well, it doesn't say that in the passage. Trust me, he was rejected, and I'll tell you why. We already know that he's a black man, and he's gone to another culture where they're all skinned. I pastored as a white man in a black church in Toronto. I know what it's like to be, to feel the color difference. He probably feels a little bit awkward at first. And he already feels a little bit of a, well, probably a lot of a misfit because of his sexual status. But if that's not bad enough, when he goes to the temple to worship, he's told to leave. Now, how do I know that he's told to leave? It says in Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, that no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting they enter the assembly of the Lord. There is a rule in the Bible that says that if you've had such a procedure, you were not welcome. The man is rejected. Now we can talk about why that would be in the Old Testament. It was more to defend the policies of, of Jewish men not doing the procedure. We're not going to go down that road right now. We want to keep our focus sharp. I just want you to see that there's a man He's likely troubled on a number of different levels. He's seeking God, and now he's banned by the rules of Judaism. The story's all of a sudden taking a different turn, isn't it? 
He's not even allowed to enter the court of the Gentiles. You have the Holy of Holies, you have the inner court, you have the court of the Gentiles. He's not allowed. Get away. I was a young pastor, and I found out after the fact that when a young lady came to church one Sunday evening for a service, that one of our other young people had sent her away because the lady coming was wearing jeans. I was mortified. She'd send me away, wouldn't she? I mean, come on. But that's happened. Imagine going to a church nowadays that's ethnically thick. Perhaps it's a gathering of, of people from, from Holland. It's a Dutch community of faith. Or maybe Ukrainian, because they exist, and even in our own area. And imagine you're not of that cultural or ethnic background, but you go to their church to worship God, and you said, no, you're not one of us. Go away. Imagine. It's unthinkable, isn't it? Imagine being identified as someone who is attracted to same-sex persons and being told you're not welcome in a church. That wouldn't happen, would it? Or would it? All this to say we are understanding the pain of the Ethiopian eunuch as he tries to discover God. Now, let's pause. In all of this, we are not saying that the gay lifestyle is okay. We're not saying that. I will not rewrite the Bible. In our church, we welcome people who lie. We welcome people who gossip. We welcome people who abuse their sexual orientation, heterosexuals who, who, who live common law, who commit adultery. Everybody's welcome. That's what we're saying. doesn't matter who you are what your life choices are, you're welcome here. Disagreeing with a person's lifestyle doesn't mean disavowing them. You see the distinction? We welcome people, no matter. And all together, we have a man here in the text who feels like a misfit. He would be one of the nuns. And when I say one of the nuns, in our culture, the people who have no religious affiliation are called the nuns. And this is the majority of Generation X, Y, and Z. I just colored it all over like that. Um, they're not opposed to God. They just don't know who God is. And they're not even really interested. Well, this guy is interested. And the narrative is not finished. we we'll change the slide there, please. The Ethiopian eunuch, I believe, makes a purchase before he leaves Jerusalem. I say that because we find him reading a scroll of Isaiah on his way home. He would have the means to purchase the scroll. He has it in his possession. I believe he's still seeking God even though he's had a door slammed in his face. More than that, the Ethiopian eunuch knows that to go home, there's kind of two roads you can go by. There's the, the easy road, which is the road that's well-traveled. It's the, it's the road where most people go because it's been prepared and it is well-traveled. But he chooses the secondary road that goes through the desert. The road that goes via Gaza. It's the long, more inconvenient, more uncomfortable road. But he goes there because it gives him time to read the scroll. And in that culture, when you read, you read out loud because you were more inclined to, to, to retain what you read. And so he's reading in this ox-driven chariot the scroll of Isaiah. And this is where Philip enters into the narrative. Philip is one of the seven deacons. We've already seen him up in Samaria. He's been the, the catalyst for, for the revival of thousands being saved and Simon the sorcerer coming to faith. He's been the catalyst for that, but now he has kind of like a spiritual whiplash, and he's all of a sudden jerked back down south of Jerusalem on this, this very rarely used desert road, because God knows that there's a man who's seeking him. And Philip travels, and he goes to that road, and he, and he sees this, this cart being pulled, and he hears the man reading from Isaiah 53, and Philip comes up alongside him recognizes what is being read. Wow. Now, can we talk about the scriptures for a moment? 
There is this new idea being circulated about, you may hear it sometime, that Jesus is the Word of God. And He is the Word of God. He's the true Word of God. John 1 and 1. But by that they mean that the Old Testament and the New Testament and anything written even in the Gospels can't be trusted. We just, Jesus is the Word, that's all we need. And they're discarding the rest and they're making up their own theology because of it. Jesus was about love, so anything goes. It's crazy because Jesus himself used the written word with authority. And so I believe the word of God, the written word, not just Jesus himself, but the written word is infused with a power that's divine. That when you read it, the Holy Spirit can, can quicken it to your spirit, to your heart. As it says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. The word of God, the written word, is more than just a book. And this man is reading the written word from Isaiah 53, but he hasn't got a clue what he's reading. R.C. Sproul, who's an incredible theologian, we just lost him within the last year, he was sitting with a man who was... And R.C. Sproul was not serving the Lord. He was not saved. He was not converted. He was kind of a... Just one of your drinking buddies. That's how he was living his life. But this man was sharing with him, and he read to him a scripture from Ecclesiastes 11, verse 3. Bizarre scripture. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there will it lie. That's the scripture that was read to him. And R.C. Sproul said... That verse struck a chord in my heart, and I felt, I saw that I was like a log that was rotting in the woods and I was going nowhere. That scripture compelled me to go to the Lord in prayer and repent, and on that day I got saved. He says, I think I'm the only person in the, in the history of, of, of biblical history that uh, has ever been saved because of that verse. But the Word of God is powerful. And, and this man is reading Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is prophetic about the identity, the nature, and particularly the death of Jesus. And, and Philip says, do you know what you read? He goes, who is this? Who is he talking about? Is he talking about, he's not talking about a sheep. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. It was a he, and as a lamb before sheer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. The guy's going, who is this about? Is it about Jeremiah himself, or is it? And Philip said, Let's take a moment. The entire Old Testament and this passage, it's all about Jesus. Everything. And he showed Jesus in the written word from the most ancient of scriptures right up to Isaiah 53. The man wanted to know who Philip told him who. And all of us should be telling those who don't know. And upon hearing the Ethiopian the eunuch, the man who felt like a misfit, who was rejected at the Jewish doors at the temple, yelled, Stop! And he said, Who can stand in the way of me being baptized in water? Even though it was a desert road, there was probably a wadi there with a little bit of, of water in it. What is to stop me from being baptized? And they got it. And on that Philip baptized him in water. And it's very specific. He put him down into the water, and he drew him out of the water, identifying him with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't sprinkling, it was full immersion. It's right there. It looks like sudden conversion. But you know that all the events and all his life experiences beforehand were bringing him to that point. Stop. A lot of people are living their lives and they're busy. Busy, busy, busy. There needs to be a moment when each of us stop and we make a decision to follow Christ. To ask Him to forgive us. To baptize us. To cleanse us. To convert us. To save us. There's a man who had worked for 40 years and he retired. During those 40 years, he had caught the 7.30 a.m. bus each and every working day. But on his first day of retirement, he sat down at the breakfast table, and his wife served him breakfast, and he said to her, 
Honey, I don't like these eggs. And she goes, I've been making them for you for 40 years. Why didn't you tell me? And he said, I just didn't have the time. And that's stupid. Everybody needs to stop. And make a decision. Your decisions determine your destiny. Now this eunuch was saved. I don't know if his troubles with his sexual identity were gone. He had to live with who he was. What had been done to him. I know God accepted him. It says in Isaiah 56.3, if you read along further in Isaiah, let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my sentence, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, I will give them, give within my temple and its walls a memorial in the name, better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. God was saying, no matter what you've heard, I will. That beautiful? I want <coughs> C.S. Lewis, we're all fond of C.S. Lewis. He wrote a book, The Silver Chair. And in this book, there's an analogy of a, of a young girl named Jill. She's in the land of Narnia. She's thirsty. At once she sees a magnific magnificent stream, and there's a there's a fearsome lion. His name is Aslan. He represents Christ. Jesus, doesn't he? Listen to Jill. If I run away, that lion will be after me in a moment, thought Jill. And if I go on, I shall run straight into its mouth. Anyway, she couldn't have moved if she had tried, but she couldn't take her eyes off at the lion. How long this lasted, she could not be sure. It seemed like hours. And the thirst, the thirst in her became so bad that she almost felt she would not mind being eaten by the lion if only she could be sure of getting a mouthful of water first. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink. May I? Could I? Would you mind? Would you mind going away while I do? said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not, not, not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was now so thirsty, without noticing that she had come a step near. D do you eat girls, she said. Oh, I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were story, nor as if it were angry. The lion just said it. I dare come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, answered the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step near. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. And it never occurred to Jill to disbelieve, disbelieve the lion. No one who had seen his stern face could ever do that. And her mind, mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she had ever had to do, but she went straight to the stream. She knelt down, and she began scooping up water in her hand, and it was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You didn't need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. And before she tasted it, she had been intending to make a dash away from the line the moment she had finished. But now she realized that this would have been on the whole the most dangerous thing of all. You don't run from the line when it's allowed you to drink. Stop and decide that 
that you will be saved, that you will be converted, that your thirst will be quenched. Heavenly Father, what a story. May your word find a place in our heart that draws us to say yes to you because we know that you have been searching for us. Just like the shepherd who lost the one sheep that lost the 99, just the lady who lost her home, you have been searching for us. Just like the father waiting for his son to come home, you've been waiting for us. What's to stop us from believing in being baptized? Nothing. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with